Um, in this paper, I offer an alternative way of thinking about dung and ash as vibrant substances. More specifically, I acknowledge the two to be animate, possessing distinct forms of non-human agency and embodying different meanings, memories and temporalities. While I draw upon archaeological, micromorphological and ethnographic research concerned with refuse within Mediterranean caves and rock shelters, I aim to demonstrate the possible applicability of some of the ideas I present to the wider field of archaeology surveys. I'll begin my talk with a brief outline of the available archaeological data and prevalent interpretations of dung and ash layers within Mediterranean caves and rock shelters. In the central part of my paper, I'll shift my focus to the vibrancies of the two substances, which originated in their material properties. I'll demonstrate that this very real and powerful force of matter acted on people in two ways. First, through material agency, which produced distinct effects on various human and non-human bodies. And second, through the matter itself, which embodied a number of meanings, memories, and temporalities. In the last part of my talk, I'll bind previously introduced ideas into my concluding thoughts. In the Mediterranean region, the use of caves and rock shelters for herding goes all the way back to the Neolithic period. The practice of using caves as temporary pens has endured for millennia, right up until modern times, and can be recognized at numerous sites in the region through a combination of several indicators. These include interchanging burnt and homogenized dung layers, concentrations of animal bones, and the physical remains of animal enclosures such as stone walls enclosing stock pens and milking structures. Traditionally, cave and rock shelter deposits associated with the panning of animals are classed under the umbrella term fumier. The primary meaning of this French term is a mix of animal dung and vegetal remains, which is used for manure. When applied in archaeological contexts, it broadly describes burned and unburned deposits associated with panning of flocks. Such sediments share a number of traits. Most often, they form complex and usually long, well-bedded successions of relatively thin layers, ranging in thickness between several millimeters and several centimeters. They are usually organized in alternating layers, unburned, partially burned, and burnt layers, and therefore form facies that are clearly recognizable in the field. Bird dung can, for example, be associated with whitish ash lenses on the site, whereas unburned and often humified dung layers can be linked with darker and often thicker deposits. Fumier generally contain relatively poor artifact assemblages such as lithics and pottery. Conversely, the byproducts of stabling, including copper lights and associated spherulites, plant tissues, phytoliths, charred wood and seeds, as well as ash, are common or even dominant. As the organic matter and phosphate pack content are high, the layers are often affected by bioturbation. The original interpretative model for fumier deposits was developed by Jacques Brochier. By employing sedimentological and micromorphological analysis, he discerned between caves and rock shelters used purely as stables and other sites used as stable and dwelling places. This model was further elaborated by Richard MacPhail, who conducted a micromorphological analysis of middle and late Neolithic sediments from the site of Arena Candidem. His analysis suggested that sheep, goat, and cattle were stabled in the cave for long periods, presumably over winter, relying mainly on fodder such as oak leaf hay and being watered on site. By the end of each seasonal panning episode, the depth of the stabling layers consisting of dung and trample bedding could reach 1.5 to 2 meters. While micromorphological evidence suggests some cleaning episodes, the most common practice for the disposal of refuse involved in situ burning. The wooden fence marking off the pen area within the cave, which would be in a poor state by the end of the winter, would be placed on top of a dung heap and set alight. The stabling layers were, according to ethnoarchaeological data, most likely to be burnt in summer when the dung had dried out. This resulted in the production of the three facies of the stabling layer, including the partially burned liquid-soaked bedding layer at the base, the ashed coprolytic layer in the middle, and the pure wood ash over the top. Within tradition, traditional archaeological discourse, Fumia are most often limited to a proxy role in the study of past economies such as herding, transhumans, and occasionally local manuring. 
If the preservation of the plant material is adequate, they may be also used for the extrapolation of information on past environments. On the other hand, the qualities of dung and ash as potent social substances are most often overlooked. Similarly, their agency, which stems from their corporeal force and perceptual interaction with people, remains unaddressed. The idea of dung and ash as vibrant substances, which is central to my talk, builds upon contemporary theoretical debate on relational persons, human and non-human agencies, and assemblage theory. Central to all this is an emphasis on minds, bodies, materials, and things, enmeshed in various actions and in a constant state of flux, in a process of continuous creation, regeneration, and transformation within distinct systems and dynamic assemblages. These ideas have recently been developed within the theoretical frameworks of material culture studies, actor network theory, political ecologies and anthropology, symmetrical archaeology, and various other strands of interpretive archaeology. Jane Bennett, for example, argues that matter in any form is intrinsically lively. Such a liveness can produce not only subtle but also dramatic effects, as illustrated by the vitality and efficacy of minerals present in the human body. Humans are, of course, composed of various distinct substances and components, including minerals in our bones, metal in our blood, and electricity running through our neurons. From a long-term evolutionary perspective, the mineralization of fleshy matter that occurred some 500 million years ago produced a new type of constructing material for a living creature, that is bone. The mineral in animal bodies set them free from previous constraints and enabled them to populate all available ecosystems, both in water and on land. If we take a long-term perspective then, mineral material appears as the mover and shaker, the active power, and the human beings with their much loaded capacity for self-directed action appear as its product. In line with Bennett, I speak from the position of vital materialist and argue that within caves and rock shelters, dung in its unburnt and burnt forms should be seen as a substance with its own agency and therefore an ability to affect other materials, things and bodies by enhancing or weakening their power. More specifically, this vibrancy of Fermier is co-shaped and co-produced by the many different biological, physical, chemical, pedagogical, social and cultural processes associated with these deposits, including bacterial action, the mobility and dispersal of pollen and seeds, the gradual humification and homogenization of dung, together with its potential for spontaneous combustion as well as its intentional burning by people. It is essential to note that the vibrancies of many of these processes exist independently of people, yet can significantly influence their relationships with particular deposits. Think, for example, of the vital-like properties of accumulated dung heaps teeming with billions of microbes thriving in the dark, smelly, sticky, viscous matter and threatening humans and animals alike while people's knowledge of pathogenic organisms and their role in the transmission of diseases was non-existent, the practice of burning down clearly shows that they were affected by and responded to the vital force of this substance. Fresh dung then acted as aggressive and object matter. Excreted by animals, it attacked people's senses, most notably their smell. As attested at several sites, People often piled it in, into heaps, frequently close to the cave wall, and eventually burnt it. This may imply that when occurring within people's living spaces, dung was perhaps considered in Mary Douglas' term as a matter out of place, as dirt which polluted the dwelling areas of caves and rock shelters and needed to be moved to the margins, <laughs> where burning would transmute it in, into a more volatile substance. Human relationships with dung and ash at cave and rock shelter sites were grounding in the material. People came to know, perceive, experience, interact with, remember and imagine the two substances through and in relation to their material bodies. The embodied experience of these two very different substances can be seen as contrasting in a number of ways. Whereas dung came in various shades of brown, ash occurred as white or gray matter. Dung was, dung was rather coarse, heterogeneous substance, while ash was much finer and more homogeneous. Fresh dung felt sticky and viscous, whereas fresh ash felt dry and porous. The first smelled and the second didn't. 
when left on its own, dung was more durable, decomposing at slow rate, while ash was more volatile and more easily dispersed or mixed with other substances. At caves and rock shelters, both dung and ash were parts of throbbing assemblages of people, animals and plants, materials and things. These numerous distinct materialities exerted different powers. Some parts of hybrid, complex and volatile clusters may have coexisted, cohabitated and cooperated, while others may have been in conflict with each other and caused or undergone friction. This is well illustrated by people and animals sharing a living space with different agencies creating the tension between order and disorder and the friction between clean and polluted space. At a certain point in prehistory, however, the relationship between animal dung and people changed following important agricultural innovations. Due to its ability to enhance the growth of plants, dung became a new medium employed in distinct fertilizing technologies. The material force of this substance would thus, in cooperation with human efforts, have increased the likelihood of a good crop yield. Furthermore, the addition of dung to agricultural soils would, along with the practices of clearing vegetation and tilling now introduced, have contributed to the creation of new cultural soils. These hybrid substances would eventually have become a material embodiment of the memory and identity of agricultural communities. Returning to dung and ash in the context of caves and rock shelters, it's important to note that both substances also embody different temporalities, with traces of the past inscribed in their materialities and with past residues living on in the present. The thick and homogenized dung layers, for instance, imply longer <coughs> cycles of panning, during which refuse accumulated into thick deposits. The presence of thin ashy lenses, on the other hand, suggests seasonal cleaning events during which places were sanitized and order temporarily restored. The further importance of the time component for refuse such as dung and ash is illustrated by Viney, who describes <coughs> waste as matter for which the time has run out. On closer inspection, however, that may not be the case. Waste may indeed imply a sense of temporal disruption, but it is also matter that lingers and remains. Is burned dung still dung, or is it a new and discrete substance of ash? Is dung mixed with soil a constitutional part of hybrid cultural soils, or does it remain separate matter? These questions clearly illustrate some fundamental features of the substances in question. Rather than possessing discrete spatial and temporal boundaries, dung, ash, and other matter have fluid and porous boundaries and are therefore in a constant state of flux, a process of continuous transformation. Archaeologists of waste have come a long way since their inception in the 1990s, particularly in terms of the range of interpretative approaches and ideas now available to scholars. However, I see no room for complacency and plenty of opportunity for us to rethink the significance of refuse and waste in the past and present. Here, with the help of range of theories, I have represented dung and ash as animate, vibrant matter, which acts on us and which actively participates in the construction of our social reality. In addition, I have discussed them with pulsating assemblages of a variety of human and non-human agencies, which interact with social structures on different timescales. These ideas are widely applicable particularly in terms of ritual performance and refuse, for example. As such, I regard them as the basis for a new way of thinking about substances that can finally take us beyond their human uses. Thank you.